Welcome back to McMaster University course, Computer Science 1JC3, Introduction to Computational Thinking. We're going to continue with the topic of three problem-solving methods. And today we're going to look at the second method, which I call Little Languages. So imagine that you have a problem and you solve the problem. So remember, with a problem you have a set of requirements, you have come up with an implementation, a solution that satisfies all the requirements. But let's say some of those requirements have changed. Now you don't, you have a solution to the wrong problem. You had a solution to the old problem. The current problem now has different requirements. You no longer have a solution. So what this means is that you have to solve the problem again. And so this shows a weakness of the approach where you just come up with a solution to a particular problem. It's much better to create a little language that can be used to solve a whole family of related problems. So this little language is made up of components, a language of components, and these are designed to work together and by putting the components together in different ways you can come up with a set of solutions for a wide range of related problems. And you come up with your little language, you put the components together, and you solve your problem at hand. And if the problem's requirements change, you just put the components together in a slightly different way, come up with a new solution. So this is a powerful way of solving problems. So the idea is you develop a little language, and that little language lets you solve a whole family of problems. Now this is also called the method of domain-specific languages. And the little languages method, in my view, is a fundamental component of computational thinking. Computer scientists, software engineers, they use this idea. They may not call it little languages, they may call it something else, but they use this idea very often to solve problems. So I'm going to give a whole series of examples of little languages. The first one concerns symbolic differentiation. So you know from calculus what the derivative is. The derivative of a function f from the real numbers to real numbers at a point a is this limit. Um, now the interesting thing is you can compute the limit of functions just by using this definition. You basically substitute your function in for f, and then you figure out what the limit is as h goes to zero. Now this can be very tedious, and it's much easier to compute derivatives using symbolic differentiation. In fact, many students in calculus never really Many of them never solve any problems using the definition directly. They solve them all using symbolic differentiation. And what is symbolic differentiation? It is a set of rules for doing differentiation. And these rules form a little language, a little language for computing derivatives and the rules there's a whole bunch of them. We can have the variable rule, the constant rule, the sum rule, product rule quotient rule, chain rule. We have rules for all the trig functions, rules for the exponential function, rule for the logarithmic function. These rules together form a little language. And using those rules, we can compute the derivatives of a huge family of functions. So this is my first example of a little language. My second is a computer graphics package. Now, it provides a little language for displaying graphic, graphical objects on a computer screen. And the language includes ways of creating graphical objects like windows, points, lines, circles, rectangles, etc. We can color these objects in various ways. We can draw these objects at different positions on the screen. We can move and transform objects. And maybe we can even collect or get mouse clicks on objects in, or in particular parts of objects. So this package is a little language. It allows us to do 
graphics applications in many different ways using the same components. So that's our second example. Um, now, before I go to our next example, I have a question for you. This is a review from our previous lecture. Uh, so here's a question. What sense is strong induction stronger than weak induction? You have four options. More statements can be proved by strong induction than weak than by weak induction. Strong induction provides a stronger induction hypothesis than weak induction. Strong induction is applicable to objects other than the natural numbers. All of the above. Okay, so I'm going to give you a moment to think about that. Well, welcome back. Um, I hope you remember that strong induction and weak induction are equivalent. You can use, if you can use weak induction to prove something, you can also use strong induction. Uh, so that means that these are wrong. They are equivalent, logically equivalent. Here's the important thing, B. Strong induction provides a stronger induction hypothesis. Now, the induction hypothesis is stronger. That means it's more useful in cases where you need that stronger induction hypothesis, but there's a bit more overhead with strong induction. So when people are proving things, usually they choose weak induction, unless it's more convenient to use strong induction. Okay, here's another question. Any total order on a finite set is a well order. Is this statement true or false? I'll give you a moment to solve or come up with an answer. Okay, welcome back. Well, if we have a finite set and it's a total order, we can think of that set as points on a line, a finite number of points. And we have a last member. There's only a finite number of points. If we go to the left, we can construct a descending sequence, but it must be finite because there's only a finite number of elements in, in our set. So every total order in a finite set, it has to be a well order. Okay, so here's another example of a little length. So, you, I'm sure you've already seen in Haskell the idea of a type class. A type class is a family of types that have a common set of functions, and they're defined here, with some default implementations. So we can have some default implementations about how we define, how we implement those functions. And these functions, by the way, are called the methods of the type class. So a type class, again, specifies a family of types. And an instance of the type is a type that implements our functions here, implements at least some of our functions here. That is what an instance is. And now, these methods are a little language. And so if you think about the num class in in the methods, you have, let's say, addition and, and um, multiplication. And you have these in all the instances of the num class. So let's take an example. So here's the EQ class. So the EQ is a family of types. And these types all have they all have an equal and a not equal. And then we have some implementation requirements. Not equal equals not equal. And the equals equals not not equals. And now here's another type. This is the ORD type. The ORD type is, is an extension of the EQ type. And we have another um, function here called compare, and we have these, I should say, methods, 
less than, less than, equal, greater, greater than, equal, and we have min and max. And we also have some default implementations. So compare produces an ordering, which is EQ, LT, GT, which means equal, less than, or greater than. So compare will work like this. And then these methods, less than, less than, equal, greater than, greater than, equal, they're defined in terms of compare that way. And min and max are defined the normal way. And then we can have various instances. And an instance, basically, what the instance needs to do is say, well, we have a type. And in this type, we need to say what e double equals is, what not equals is, what compare is, and all these are, and what min and max are. OK, so let's go to another example of a little language. So let's talk about a software module. A software module has two components, an interface, that's a set of services offered by the module to other modules, and an implementation, and that's the software that provides the services in the interface. So the interface is a little language of services. And so you can use these services, put them together various ways, and solve various problems. So this is a very, very important example of a little language that's used everywhere in software development. And finally, I'm going to end with another example of a little language. This is actually, we can, it's a little more than a little language. This is what's called axiomatic theory. It's a language in some underlying logic. Here's the language. And we have gamma, capital gamma, is a set of formulas called the axioms of the theory. And so a model of this theory is an interpretation of how in which all the axioms in gamma are true. So we could have a theory, let's say, of total orders. And a model would be a set with a ordering relation, which is total. So you can think of a axiomatic theory as a specification of a set of structures or models. So here's an example. This is going to be the theory of monoids. So in this theory we have a language and includes two things, a symbol E and a symbol mol, which is like multiplication. And the axioms are three axioms. The first says that mol is associative. The second says that E is a right identity element with respect to mole. And the third says that E is a left identity element with respect to mole. So this, this theory is a theory of, of monoids. And a model is some set of things, like we could say we could have strings, the empty string, and concatenation could be multiplication. That would be a model. Because concatenation is associative. And the empty string acts like E, acts like an identity element with respect to concatenation. So a theory is a little language with a set of assumptions. And as I said, it can be viewed as a specification of its mod mod models. And a type class isn't an axiomatic, is an axiomatic theory with implicit or only partially explicit axioms. Remember I said there were these default implementations. You can think of those as axioms. OK, so we're going to stop here with our second problem-solving method, little theories.